good day everyone. So for today's presentation, I'm here to discuss the responsibilities of engineers. Loyalty to corporations, respect for authority, collegiality, and other forms of teamwork are all important characteristics in the field of engineering. In a corporation driven by powerful egos, engineering professionalism would be threatened at every turn. According to Sir Robert Jackall, a sociologist, what is right in the corporation is what the guy above you wants from you. That is what corporate morality is. Consider the following points to understand how good the ethical factors in a corporate world should be. First, managers and employees equally recognize and value ethical values in all of their complexities. Second, the use of ethical language is honestly applied and recognized as a legitimate part of corporate discussion in an ethical corporate climate. Next, top management sets a moral tone through their words, policies, and personal examples. And lastly, conflict resolution procedures must be followed. Loyalty. The faithful adherence to an organization and the employer is referred to as loyalty. There are two kinds of loyalty to an employer. First is the agency loyalty. It is defined as acting to fulfill one's contractual duties to one's employer. This is entirely a matter of actions such as performing one's duties and not stealing from one's employer, regardless of the motivation. Next is the attitude loyalty. This is as much about attitudes, emotions, and a sense of personal identity as it is about actions. People who work grudgingly and spitefully are not loyal. Despite the fact that they may adequately perform all of their work responsibilities and thus demonstrate agency loyalty. Collegiality refers to a work environment in which responsibility and authority are shared among colleagues. When engineering codes of ethics mention collegiality, they usually refer to acts of disloyalty. Professional disloyalty to an organization reflects their attitude toward the work environment for the salaries they are paid and the trust the company has in them. According to the National Society of Professional Engineers Code or NSPE, engineers shall not attempt to injure maliciously or falsely, directly or indirectly, the professional reputation, prospects, practice, or employment of other engineers. Engineers who believe others are guilty of unethical or illegal practice shall present such information to the proper authority for action. The main factors that contribute to workplace harmony are as follows. Respect, commitment, and connectedness. In comprehensive manner, peers should be respected for their work and contributions to organizational goals as well as valued for their professional expertise and commitment to the social goods promoted by the profession. Commitment is defined as a shared devotion to the moral ideas inherent in one's profession. Coordination among all workplace members or the awareness of participating in cooperative projects based on shared commitments and mutual support also promotes work quality. Professionals must respect authority in order to achieve organizational objectives. The organization's level of authority provides a means of identifying areas of personal responsibility and accountability. The major types of authority are as follows. The executive authority is the corporate or institutional right granted to a person to exercise power based on an organization's resources. While expert authority is the possession of specialized knowledge, skill, or competence to carry out a specific task or provide sound advice. The authority structure is distributed based on the company's goals. A service-oriented or engineer-oriented company focuses on the quality of the products which are determined by the engineers, who are subject matter experts. A customer-oriented company, on the other hand, focuses primarily on a customer satisfaction. As a result, the power balance between a general manager and a technical manager or engineer is determined by the company's goals. When we discuss issues, 
There can be issues which need to be discussed among the employees themselves and resolutions can be found for the same. In order to deal with such complex situations, an employee union is formed wherein each employee becomes a member and a leader is elected to represent the group whenever needed. At the time of the conflicts or arguments, there will arise the need for negotiation between the parties. The underlying idea of collective bargaining is that the employer and employee relations should not be decided unilaterally or with the intervention of any third party. Both the parties must reconcile their differences voluntarily through negotiations, yielding some concessions, and making sacrifices in the process. Both parties have more or less realized the importance of peaceful coexistence for mutual benefit and continued progress. Let us now look at the various types of collective bargaining. Collective bargaining can be classified into four types. First is the distributive bargaining. One party's gain is another party's loss in this case. Wages as an example. Second is the integrative bargaining. In this case, either both parties may benefit or neither party may suffer a loss. Better training programs for example. Third is the attitudinal structuring. When there is a history of animosity between the two parties, attitudinal restructuring is required to ensure smooth industrial relations. And lastly, Intra-organizational bargaining Both management and unions can have opposing factions. As a result, these groups must reach an agreement.